Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals the podcast. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Now this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by three very important and very distinguished sponsors. First up we have ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Regular listeners of Knowing Animals will know ASA very well. They have supported Knowing Animals for quite a few years now. ASA is the membership body for academics, artists and advocates interested in animal issues. Now ASA does very good work to support animal studies scholars. You can follow ASA at their Facebook page. You can also join ASA by going to their website, the Australasian Animal Studies Association ASA website. Supporting ASA is a way to support animal studies. So please think about joining ASA, the organisation that supports animal studies scholars and artists. Our second sponsor is a new sponsor. Our second sponsor is actually a book. The book is called After Katsia, an anthology of animal fictions. Now, After Katsia is published by Fornery Press. That's F A U. N-A-Y Press. Now, people who have been following animal issues for many years will know that Katsia has had a very impact, very big impact on animal studies. Katsia is a very, very well-regarded uh, writer. He is a winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature and he often addresses very tricky and important animal issues. So this book is a very good way about thinking about the impact that Katsia has had on animal fictions. So I highly recommend the book to you. You can find out more about where to find the book in the notes for this podcast and my recommendation is that you go and buy a copy One for yourself, but also order one for your university library. So that's the book After Katsia, an anthology of animal fictions. Grab one for your university or local library. Right, our final sponsor is Kibble. That is K-I-B-B-L. Now, Kibble is a new app that has been developed to data mine information from the web about adoptable pets from pounds and animal sanctuaries. And it's also an app that you can use to raise money for animal charities. So I have been following Kibble on Facebook and I have to warn you, they have some very, very adorable animals that are currently at pounds or animal shelters looking for their forever home. But Kibble isn't just something that can be followed on Facebook. They're also an app. So go to uh, your local app store, Google Play or such, and download Kibble. It's a free app. And by using it, you'll be helping animals find their forever home. You can learn more about Kibble by going to their website, which is kibbl.io. And you can learn more information about the organization and the work they do by, again, having a look at the podcast notes. So there are our three sponsors for this episode, and I thank them very much for their support. And today I'm very lucky to be joined by an eminent professor all the way from the UK. As listeners, Australian-born listeners will know, we love anyone who arrives by aeroplane, particularly from the UK. So today I'm joined by Professor Robert Garner from the University of Leicester. And he'll be very, very well known to many listeners and certainly to animal studies scholars. So Robert is here as a guest of HAN, which is the Human Animal Research Network, based at the University of Sydney. And Robert's been doing a lot of things while he's been here, including speaking to me at Knowing Animals. So today we're going to be discussing Robert Garner's contribution to the book, The Political Turn in Animal Ethics, which he co-edited with um, the wonderful Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. And Robert's chapter is called Animals, Politics and Democracy. Uh, The book is published by Rowan, Roman and Littlefield. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. Thank you, Siobhan. Good to be here. 
So, Robert, can you start by telling me why you wrote this chapter or what inspired you to write this chapter? Well, one of the the key features of the so-called political turn in animal ethics is the attempt to show how animals can be incorporated into the democratic system. So moral philosophers have considered the, the, the... considered our moral obligations to to animals, how as individuals we ought to behave. But a political turn is concerned with uh, considering how political institutions can incorporate the interests of animals. So that's very much the starting point. Right. So the expression political turn is starting to gain currency. Um... You're one of the preeminent theorists in the field. Why Why generate a book? Why a whole book on the topic? Well, I, I, I've been working for almost 30 years now uh, from a political science and political theory perspective. Um, and for, for many years, I was plowing a pretty lonely furrow. But in recent years, there's been a major expansion of people, including your good self, Siobhan, working on uh, the political dimension to the animals debate. What can political scientists and political theorists uh, add to the debate about uh, animal ethics and the way animals are treated? So it seemed an appropriate time to put together a volume which uh, sought to sketch out this new dimension to the debate you choose to discuss animals and politics in relation to democracy in this book chapter. Why the focus on democracy? Well, because democracy is the um, democracy is a is a is a good word. Um, it's regarded by most, even those states which aren't democratic, as an aspiration. Um, and given that it's a major way in which collective decisions are made, it seems the appropriate place to start when considering uh, animals. But it's not just any kind of democracy that you're particularly interested in, is it? You're, you're particularly concerned with deliberative democracy. Can you explain to listeners what deliberative democracy is? I'll try. Um, well, de- deliberative democracy can be contrasted with our current system which is based on democracy by aggregation. So what our current uh, democratic systems do is simply measure pre-existing preferences and then aggregate the results. What deliberation is concerned about is uh, how those preferences are arrived at and the argument is that if decisions are made in a deliberative way then they may be uh, uh, p- people's opinions may be changed as a result of this practice. And do you have reason to believe that a deliberative democratic process could be beneficial from the perspective of animals? Yeah, there's there's quite a bit of literature now looking at the benefits to environmental protection of, of deliberation. And some of the themes in the uh, green political theory on this issue seems to apply to animals as well. So, for instance, uh, deliberative democracy insists upon inclusivity, which would allow all uh, all opinions on a particular issue to be represented, which will surely help animal advocates who often complain that they they are uh, uh, they are left out of a political debate. It also encourages. Uh, empathy. Uh, it, it, it encourages people to put aside their self-interest and to appeal to the public or common good as opposed to um, uh, much contemporary politics which is based on self-human interest. So a focus on empathy should encourage people to think about not just about other humans but also non-humans too. And is there some evidence that this does happen in practice? Well, uh, much of the work done on deliberative democracy is theoretical, but increasingly now there there is empirical work 
and there have been a number of cases of deliberation which have involved the treatment of animals. Um, and the the uh, part of my research has been to identify these exercises and, and to, to review them. And there does seem some evidence that de uh, deliberative exercises involving animal issues does lead to people changing their views uh, along the lines of supporting greater protection for animals. Mm. So, so far we've learnt that the the book chapter is in a book about the political turn and the political turn is focused on kind of a system-wide or a, um, an institutional approach to animals rather than an individual moral approach. And we've also heard that you have incorporated democracy because that has very um, positive connotations and is um, the kind of political institutional framework that people either either admire or, or claim to admire. And deliberation has some things going for it because it engenders empathy and there's some, some suggestion that perhaps it could be good from an animal protection perspective. But can you step us through the other elements of your argument that are missing from that puzzle so far? Yes, I mean, d d deliberation involves tweaking democracy in a way which may make it more amenable to the interests of animals. Um, but that, in many ways, is a, is a more pragmatic answer to the problem. A more radical approach is to consider whether our current democratic framework is normatively justified. And there's some evidence that suggests that, that our current anthropocentric democratic system is in fact an inadequate version of democracy. Uh, by anthropocentric I mean that in our current democratic system the extent to which uh, animal interests are represented depends upon the capacity of human beings to uh, identify those interests and, and support the promotion of them. Uh, there's no sense in which the interests of animals are directly incorporated in the political process, which arguably a, a normatively justifiable theory of democracy ought to do, particularly if we regard um, uh, regard democracy as being uh, uh, necessary for um, representing all affected interests. Um, and if that's the case, if that's the answer to the boundary problem, you know, who is to be a member of the political community, and the answer is everyone affected by those decisions, then quite clearly the, there's a strong case of saying that animals are often profoundly affected by political decisions, and therefore their voices ought to be heard in, in, in decision-making. So a more radical approach to deliberation an alternative deliberation would uh, alternative to del the deliberative democracy would be to uh, develop a non anthropocentric theory of democracy and one version of that is the citizenship model associated with uh, Donaldson and Kimlicker in the chapter I also offer an alternative model based on enfranchising the interests of of animals so in a sense Deliberative democracy is a fallback position. If we could have a, if we could imagine and operationalize a inclusive form of democracy, that would be better. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Partly so. Um, it might be deliberation might be regarded as to, to use uh, the language of, of political philosophy, a non-ideal theory, uh, in the sense that it's a kind of. Uh, uh, a, a pragmatic approach because we regard a non anthropocentric theory as being uh, too utopian. But having said that, there have been cases where, where uh, political systems have considered uh, how to represent the interests of, say, future generations who are not, whose voices are not directly represented in the political process. So current democratic systems are only concerned with currently living humans um, and so future generations don't get uh, 
uh, much of a hearing. So some political systems in the world have tried to find a way to have the interests of future generations represented. Um, and one can envisage that being done for, for animals too. So it's not, I wouldn't say that the, that a non-anthropocentric theory is, is completely beyond the pale in terms of its uh, likelihood of being achieved. So the the concept of all affected or the all affected principle, so-called, that does perhaps pose some challenges for people who are particularly interested in non-human animals and not other kind of other kinds of living entities or even ecosystems, etc. What do you say in response to that? How do we decide who is affected? Well, one of the issues with the all affected principle is 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 it's, it's potentially very broad, not just in terms of the incorporation of non-human interests, but also in the way in which human interests are represented. So, for instance, in our current bounded state model, um, uh, that would seem to be inadequate from the perspective of the all affected principle because a decision made by one government may have significant implications for for people in other political jurisdictions. So even from a human perspective, the all affected principle is wide. But as you say, you know, it, it could be extended even further to include not just uh, non-human animals, but also nature. And indeed, it has been used by green political theorists to justify the, in, the inclusion of the interests of nature in the political process. I don't necessarily uh, uh, reject that approach but in order to narrow it down because my concern is non-human animals uh, it's possible to uh, uh, to qualify who's affected uh, and use sentience as a way of doing it so that only those who are sentient have interests which need which require representation in the political process so you are a political theorist and you also try to keep an eye on the real world and uh, not be too um, abstracted in your thinking. Are you optimistic about the chances that we might be able to reform our political systems to better cater for the interests of non-human animals? Well, in the sense that this widespread disillusionment with current democratic practice, not not just because animals are excluded, but, but because of its, um, its many weaknesses, um, this is an ideal opportunity, I think, for democratic reform. And indeed, you know, there have been numerous uh, and ever-growing cases where deliberation has been attempted by governments. People are increasingly disillusioned by, you know, uh, soundbite politics, the dominance of money, um, etc. And also government's inability and unwillingness to to deal with intractable moral problems. And that, it seems an ideal opportunity to, to employ all, uh, different models of democratic decision making. So in that sense, I'm optimistic that deliberation will become even more popular. Certainly in, in, in academia, Deliberative democracy has been a major part of political theory over the past 20 years. Much political theory has been about deliberative democracy. Mm. So moving then from real-world politics to political theory and animals, do you feel optimistic that the discipline of political science will continue to embrace animal questions and that kind of more people will start to think in this mode? Oh, without doubt. I mean, when I, as I said earlier, when I first started, um, there was barely anyone else, certainly in the UK, working on animal issues from a political science or political theory perspective. I mean, literally no one else. But if you look at the expansion of uh, interestedness amongst academics over the past 10, 20 years, it, it's been phenomenal. Um, and what's more... Uh, there would seem to be a large number of graduate students as well coming through, uh, increasingly interested in in animal issues. So it's looking much healthier than it was when I first started doing it. Mm. Well, you were very brave to 
be out there alone uh, for so long, Robert. So, um, and you certainly were one of the people who inspired me when I was a PhD student and didn't have many uh, political scientists to, to turn to. Now, I ask everybody who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I am, yes. I'll do my best. Yes. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Well, I, I guess I'd have to be boringly predictable here and say, you can guess, animal liberation. <laughs> um, I guess it's partly because when I first started reading on this issue, uh, there was very little else to read, except if you went back to the writings of the early, nine, uh, early 20th century and people like Henry Salt. I mean, Singer was a key figure, really, in, this, uh, in the development of this, um, uh, of this area. Um, and probably a lot of other people have said the same thing to you. Mm -hmm. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? That was such a long time ago now. Um, I wrote an article on the animal lobby, mainly focusing on the UK, for a British journal called Political Quarterly. But don't ask me to give you the date. I think it was 87 or 88. And was that That's 1980, not 1880. <laughs> and was that after you had your first academic appointment? That that wasn't drawn from your PhD or anything? Uh, no, that was before my first academic appointment, actually. Um, and it wasn't at all to do with my PhD, which was on something entirely different. Mm. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Well... Um, You'd expect me to say Singer and Regan, but I'm actually not going to say that. I, I, you know, I think most people would say Singer and Regan have been influential to them. The, the person who I I would uh, mention here is Richard Ryder. Um, Richard's not a, an academic in a conventional sense, so he has held some academic positions, but he's a psychologist by training. But I've learned a great deal from his books on the development of the history of the animal protection movement. Um, but I also say Richard on a personal level because uh, Richard was always very kind and encouraging uh, to me when I first started doing this work um, in in a very inhospitable climate in many ways. He was also chairman of the, RS, the British RSPCA Council and he really made an effort to secure some research funding for me. Um, not just for me, but for one or two others as well. And that was the first time that the RSPCA, and one of the few times ever, actually, that the RSPCA has given money to social scientists as opposed to natural scientists. Mm -hmm. So I, I owe Richard quite, quite a, a big debt, I think. Oh, that's lovely. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Well, I'm a, a great believer in demarcation. Uh, and, you know... That's probably an excuse for saying that my uh, that I think that the the aims of academics should be quite limited in a way. I, I mean, you know, I regard it as my role to promote consideration of non-humans, non-human animals in particular, within my discipline, the discipline of of political theory. I think if it uh, if if uh, if it has any other external impacts, then that's that's even better. But I think um, we started from a very low ebb um, 20, 30 years ago, and uh, uh, it's it's really uh, encouraging to see how um, many people are now working on this issue within my discipline, and that I think that's uh, that's that's a good thing. Mm. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human -human animal relationship, what would it be? That's a difficult one because I guess <laughs> there's a temptation to say I, I'd want to uh, r r remove uh, the mindset that humans seem to have that that's the suffering of animals is routinely acceptable. Um, but I guess, you know, we'd, we'd all say that, all... Uh, Animal scholars would say that. Um, but I do think that in order to achieve that goal, it's important that 
we recognize and emphasize and promote the idea that animals have intrinsic value that they have moral standing that 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 what we do to them matters to them and not to other uh, and not what the impact is on on other humans how we achieve that of course is the <laughs> is the uh, the big question i mean i you know from a personal point of view i think that that uh, um animal ethics should should be part of the school curriculum or at least moral philosophy applied ethics should be part of the school curriculum um so that 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 children are uh, 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 given the opportunity to to engage with this debate at the present time it appears in in the uk at least in in uh, uh, in the re uh, religious education curriculum uh, but it's not routinely considered in, in school environments uh, one of the most important things maybe that academics can do is to uh, and, uh, academics who are interested in animal ethics is is to uh, make themselves open to being invited by schools to talk about the issue, which I've done uh, a few times. Um, so education, I think, is crucially important here. Hmm. So, Robert, what are you working on next? Well, I have a two-year funded research uh, project which starts... Uh, the end of 2017 which is an intellectual history of the animal rights movement and in particular the intellectual history of the Oxford group it's a group of scholars who mainly postgraduate students postgraduate philosophy students who converged on Oxford in the late 60s including Peter Singer to look at what motivated them to uh, to take on board uh, animal ethics, and and to consider, you know, the origins of 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 what of Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, the book that's regarded as a, you know, the Bible of the animal rights movement. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I really look forward to learning more about how that project is progressing and also your findings. How can people find out more about your work? Mainly through uh, my university's. Uh, web page um, which is fairly easy to navigate that's the University of Leicester so if you go into the University of Leicester look find the uh, School of History and Politics and uh, look for the staff in the School of History and Politics you'll find me and that lists all my publications what we do intend to do as part of the research project that I just talked about is uh, set up a separate linked web page on it so uh, uh, that will be available in, in due course too. Wonderful. Well, Robert, thank you so much to, for joining us on Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Now, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or you can follow me at SO underscore S. We also have a Facebook page, Knowing Animals. And most importantly, don't forget to leave a review at iTunes. Reviews at iTunes mean everything in the podcasting world. They help us go up in the rankings and it makes it easier for other people to find the podcast. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.